Good afternoon and welcome to today's webcast. Our topic today is designing to win in 100G Ethernet, tools and methodologies for success, sponsored by Keysight Technologies and Xilinx. I'm Christy Martino with Penton's Design Engineering and Sourcing Group. To begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply hit F5 to refresh your webcast console. If you need assistance solving common issues, please click on the yellow help icon located below the slides. To maximize the slide presentation window, click on the small green button at the top right corner of the slide window. Please know that we welcome your questions during today's event. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your questions at any time. To do so, simply type your question into the question window on the side of your screen, then hit the submit button. Additionally, today's session is being recorded and will be emailed to you within the next week. You may also download a PDF copy of the slides by clicking the green folder icon in the toolbar beneath the slides. Now let me introduce today's speaker. Brandon Zhao received his PhD in 2005 in electromagnetic field and microwave technology from Beijing University of Posts and Telecommunications. He joined Xilinx in 2014 as a staff transceiver, technical marketing engineer, focusing on state-of-the-art transceiver definition and development. From 2012 to 2014, he was with Surdi's application team of Intel Custom Foundry at Intel of Canada, where he worked on post-silicon characterization and high-speed Surdi's PCB SIPI simulation and analysis. Prior to joining Intel, he worked as a senior system I.O. specialist at Xilinx China. Prior to that, he worked as a hardware designer at Nortel China. His current interest is in transceiver design and development, signal integrity, power integrity simulation, and high-speed backplane design. Now, let me turn things over to Stephen Slater from Keysight. Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for everyone joining today. Um, my name is Stephen Slater. I'm a product manager with Keysight ESOF EDA. Now, before we get started, I want to take a moment to set the scene. Um, today's webcast is uh, one in a series of tutorials in signal integrity. And at the end of the presentation today, you're going to find a link where you will be able to go and um, watch uh, prior recordings of webcasts that have passed. Also, um, specifically these, uh, these uh, presentations uh, to talk about um, tools and methodologies for particular applications. Typically, it's uh, application engineers from Keysight that provide the presentation, but today we're very lucky to have a customer and valued partner present the topic. So Brandon's going to describe the simulation methodology that Xilinx have come up with for designing for 100G into Ethernet. At the end of the presentation, you're going to understand the simulation steps that are involved um, with the design. You'll understand Xilinx transceiver capabilities. And you're also going to find out where to download the resources or design kits that Xilinx can provide. So I'm going to cover the first section, which is just going to give you a look at um, the design challenges of 100 gig gigabit Ethernet and make sure that we're all on the same page. And I'm going to pass over to Brandon to cover the rest of the section. Okay, so IEEE created 40G Ethernet as well as 100G Ethernet for two slightly different applications. Uh, one is for local networks and the other is to support Internet backbones. Now, as always, the need for higher bandwidth and higher data throughput is the main driver. So this is us uh, streaming video at home, but also um, businesses pushing and retrieving large amounts of data to, to the cloud for processing, um, and also to support high-performance computing. Now, both of these standards support a range of transmission media, but today in this presentation, we're going to be focused mostly on electrical backplanes. Now, 100G is quite special because for the first time, it introduces a new signaling technique. It's a four-level pulsed amplitude modulation. Now, what this means is that instead of transmitting ones and zeros directly, what we do is we instead transmit a symbol. So we can transmit one of four levels, and each level represents two bits of information. Now, PAM4 is considered to really take off in future standards past 100G, but one of the things that does give us the ability to do is to use existing legacy uh, electrical backplanes um, and, uh, and now pass uh, more data through it. 
Now, 100G is not 100 gigabits per second in a single differential pair. Um, it's achieved by routing eight, uh, eight differential pairs of 25 gigabits per second. So we're going to have four pairs for transmitting the TX and four for the receiving the RX. Um, but at these speeds, we need to pay careful attention to the routing from the FPGA to the optical module or the backplane connector. The biggest challenges that we see is the need to keep skew minimized. Now, you'll see that um, in some of the pictures that we have here, uh, the, there's, there's definitely a need to, to use jog outs and meanders in order to keep um, the length of the lines very, very, um, very, very close. But the, the difficulty we have is that at 25 gigabit per second, the unit interval is so very small. So any, any small changes in skew, um, any sections where the electrical length is not quite uh, the same is going to give us um, a mode conversion. So we're going to get differential to common mode and we end up with, um, with significant uh, signal degradation in doing so. Also, we need to pay very careful attention to designing the vias themselves to minimize impedance mismatch. This means paying very close attention to the, the ground return paths and also um, designing the vias for uh, a, an impedance that's going to be matched towards the transmission line um, at the Nyquist frequency, so at uh, 12 and a half gigahertz. We also have uh, big challenges when it comes to crosstalk. Um, now, if you're using a specific FPGA, the high-speed transceivers have a particular um, ball out, so you'll have a, the, the pins will be decided for you on the package. But how you choose to get those signals out away from the BGA, um, what we call the I.O. breakout and then the trace escape, is certainly within your control. And ensuring that you, um, you, you keep crosstalk down to a minimum is, uh, is, is very important for 100G Ethernet. Next, I'm going to pass over to Brandon and um, i will take you through the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen, and thank you all very much for joining this webinar. I'm Brandon Jell from Xilinx. Today, I'm hoping to give you an overview of Xilinx's work on 100G design. First, I'd like to give you an overview of a backplane system as shown in the diagram. As we know, the serial data is sent from TX to RX through different media sections, including the device packages, the PCB traces, VEs, and the connectors. Generally, a backplane system could be as long as 40 inches or 1 meter. If it is a 100G base CR4 application, the channel could be of a 5 meter QSIP 28 plus passive cable. So the signal will experience high channel loss. Also, as we know, the impairments like jitter, intersignal interference, crosstalk, and the noise could degrade the signal integrity along the channel. And the final system margin really depends on both the passive and the active devices. As mentioned, the channel's insertion loss is a main reason of loss of margin. But there are some other impairments play important roles in the backplane system performance. The first one is reflections. Reflections come from the impedance mismatch along the channel. In some setups, the reflections could be so large that it makes the channel insertion loss very bumpy. Thus, it could be even more harmful than the channel insertion loss. We use the insertion loss deviation, or ILD, to assess the channel smoothness. ILD is defined as the differences between the real insertion loss and the feed insertion loss. The next item we care about is crosstalk. Crosstalk is the noise coupled through some paths like vias, connectors, and packages. It could be more harmful than the channel insertion loss in some link setups. Here is an example. Let's take the blue lane as the victim and make the other three adjacent lanes as aggressors. The port mapping is like this. The victim receiver is connected to port 6 and 8. The noise capital from ports 1 and 3 to port 6 and 8 is far and crosstalk. That's the fact. The noise capital from ports 10 and 12, 14 and 16 to the port 6 and 8 is near and crosstalk, known as next. 
as we know generally, the TX output signal is much larger than the transmitted signal through a backplane. So a small portion of the TX signal power coupled to the adjacent RX could be very harmful. To assess the strength of the crosstalk, several different concepts are used, including the power sum crosstalk, the insertion loss to crosstalk ratio, ICR, the integrated crosstalk noise, ICN, and the channel operating margin, COM. In the previous slides, I introduced some impairments that take the channel margin away. Now, I'm hoping to introduce Xilinx transceiver equalization capabilities. Here is an abstract diagram of Xilinx transceiver channel. On the TX side, all transceivers had a three-tab FIR to implement the TXD emphasis. The three tabs include the precursor, main cursor, and the post cursor. Both the precursor and post cursor de-emphasis suppress the low frequency components at the transmitter. At the receiver end, we have the three-stage continuous time linear equalization, CTLE. CTLE is the technique to attenuate the low frequency component of the signal while boosting the high frequency component. It is well known that linear equalization techniques such as CTLE have one major limitation. That is the noise amplification. When a noise such as reflections or crosstalk is present on the channel, CTLE amplifies the high frequency noise right along with the data. After the CTLE, there is the decision feedback equalization, DFE. DFE is a proven technique to mitigate ISI without amplifying noise. It works by directly removing the ISI from previous bits, allowing the current bit to be correctly sampled. For example, here is the unequalized single bit response of a backplane. The DFE starts with the decision slicer to determine whether the current symbol is high or low. The resulting symbol goes through unit delays and multiplies with the tab weights. The weighted delayed signal are added together and then subtracted from the input signal. The red curve here is then the equalized single bit response. As we know, the DFE only compensates post cursors ISI and cannot remove precursor induced ISI. The Xilinx transceivers of GTH and GTY in the Ultra Scale and Ultra Scale Plus devices have 11 and 15 DFE tabs respectively. As marked in the diagram, the long tail beyond the DFE tabs will be suppressed by the CTLE. Since generally the copper cables have long impulse response tails, this capability is important for the transceiver to be successfully used in the copper cable applications like the 100G CR4. Finally, both the CTLE and the DFE inside the transceivers are fully adaptive. After talking about the Xilinx transceiver equalization capability, I'd like to introduce how we enable our customers to evaluate the transceiver performance inside the silicon. We have the non-destructive on-chip debug capability. It's the in-silicon system analysis with eye scan. In the RX path of Xilinx transceivers, there are two samplers. One is the data sampler at the eye center. The other one is the movable offset sampler. Through the Xilinx debug tool iBird, the user can set the voltage and the phase offset for the movable sampler, and iBird compares the sampled bits between the data sampler and the movable sampler. Then it plots the 2D eye scan results based on the numbers of arrows and the number of bits accumulated for BR. The plot on the bottom right is a screen capture of the Xilinx iBird GUI. As the data rate increases, the signal integrity simulation is more and more important for a successful system design. To help our customers ISI work, we develop the signal integrity design kit based on ADS. For our experience, 
we classify the customer support into several stages. The first stage is a channel model verification stage. In this stage, there can be two cases. The first is that a customer just started the work and is checking the stack up and transmission line design requirement. There is no S parameters extracted yet. The customer may want to check the PCB tree's geometry to ensure the impedance and loss. Also, customer may want to check some impairments impact, such as the intra-pair skew. Here is an example about intra-pair skew impact. In the example, the transmission line is configured to be no coupling between its P and N. And the differential impedance is set to 100 ohm. The transient simulation is running at 25 Gbps with PRBS pattern. And the rise fall time is 20 picoseconds. Since ADS supports both the transient simulation and the frequency analysis simulation at the same time, it is easy to generate and check the results in time and frequency domains simultaneously. First, let's start with the simulation result with no skew. From left to right and top to bottom, I plot the impulse response in chart 1, PRBS waveform in chart 2. Differential TD, RTDT in chart 3, RX received idogram in chart 4. The single entity TD, RTDT are in chart 5. The mode conversion SDC12 and the differential insertion loss SDD12 are presented in chart 6 and 7. Here we can see the insertion loss is too small to count and the same the mode conversion is. Then I start to inject the intra-pair skew with a percentage of UI and plot them against the no skew results for comparison. Also, I will put the corresponding electrical lens in material of M6 for the in-pair skew injected. Here is the result of a 10% um, UI skew. As we can see, in the frequency domain, the insertion loss increased a little while the mode conversion increased from less than minus uh, to 20 dB to around 16 dB. Actually, the mode conversion increment is the reason of the increase of the differential insertion loss. In the time domain, we can see the signal edge has been degraded by the skew. Here comes the 20% UI. The changes are more and the eyes start to close due to the eye degradation. Followed by the 30% UI. In chart 7 on the top right, here comes a notch in the insertion loss plot in the observed frequency span as shown there. Here is the 40% UI and the 50% UI. At half UI intra-pair skew, we can see the mode conversion in chart 6 is up to minus 3.175 dB, and the differential insertion loss in chart 7 grows to minus 3.175 dB. So the pure intra-pair skew of half UI introduces around 3 dB in differential insertion loss increase. After the 50% UI, here is the 60%. The impulse response becomes bimodal shape. It should be noted that if using different rights for time, we'll start to see the bimodal shape at different intra-pair skew value. Here is the 70% UI, 80% UI, 90% UI, and finally, when the intra-pair skew is one UI, the insertion loss at microsoft frequency is around minus 206 dB since the mode conversion is increased to minus 0.16 dB. In the time domain, the clock pattern at a full data rate becomes flat line as shown in the chart 2 of the PRBS waveforms. And the eye is totally closed in chart 4. After the example, I'd like to go back to the simulation support flow. If the S parameters of the channel have been extracted from the measurement or simulation, we need to verify them. Now I'm hoping to give you another example to e explain. 
why we need to check the channel models before we run the IBIS MI simulation for channel margins. In this example, there are four touchstone files extra extracted from the same backlink channel. They are of different start and the stop frequency as well as the sampling step. Also, in the example, all the simulations are used in the interpolation mode for SMP model interpolation. Now let's check the time domain result first. Here is the first model re simulation result. I plot the single bit response in chart 1 on the top, and below is the impulse response in chart 2. In the bottom left, the two charts 3 and 4 are differential TTT and TTR simulation. Since the back plane insertion loss is high, the TTR results won't be perfect at the far end. So I swapped the source location in the TDR simulations in charts 3 and 4 so as to obtain accurate measurement from both the differential ports. Also, all the impedance plots in chart 5 through chart 8 are assessed in the same way. As we can see, this model gives a reasonable time response in terms of causality and impedance features. Now, let's check the other channel models. First, let's check what if, what if we increase the star frequency from 10 MHz to uh, 153 MHz. In chart 1, the single bit response has a apparent DC level shift. In chart 3 and 4, as marked by the red ovals, the TDT plots have pre-rising before the transition, and the peak-to-peak -peak swing reduced from 0 0.90, uh, 0 0.946 volts to 0 0.91 volts. At the same time, in the area marked by the blue ovals in chart 5 through 8, the differential impedance and the single-ended impedance plots show as waves. In the first model simulation results, they were monotonically rising. Let's move back to the first model results for a comparison now. As shown in chart 5, the impedance of the marked portion is monoton monotonically rising. It is because this portion is part of the long traces of the backplane. The backplane used the low loss material and the conductive loss dominates the total loss. The conductive loss makes the DC resistance and AC resistance increase along the channel. When moving to the second model plot, the non-monotonic impedance curve in chart 5 does not make engineering sense regarding the known location in this backplane. That's why we don't think this model gives the correct information of the channel. Next. Let's move to the channel model that has lower stop frequency. In this model, the stop frequency goes from 40 GHz down to the 15 GHz. Then, not saying the reduce the TDT peak-to-peak -peak swing show in chart 3, just check the impulse response and then the single bit response in chart 2 and 1, we can see the apparent non-causal issues as marked by the red ovals. We know this is gives the phenomena. Next, let's move to the last channel model. The last channel model is extracted with the same start and stop frequencies, but with 10 times the raw sampling step, i.e. from 6.25 to 62.5 megahertz. As marked in the charts, we see the repose before the transition in all the time domain responses. And in the tails of the impulse response and a single bit response, the ripple also populates. These non causal results are from time aliasing, which is caused by the raw sampling step in the frequency domain. After checking the time domain results, I'd like to have a look of the frequency domain and try to find some information that can correlate between the two domains. The first frequency plot is the reference channel model. On the top right, 
The chart one is the phase plot of the differential insertion loss. The insertion loss phase linearity of this channel looks good. Channel two is the return loss plot. The light blue spot marks the 153 megahertz. So later, it's easy for us to see what changes below it when we increase the star frequency. On the bottom left, the chart three shows the power plot of the insertion loss. As we can see, it is smooth and always clockwise through the whole range of the frequency span. Now we move to the next channel model with a start frequency of 153 megahertz. So in chart one, we almost see nothing change, but in chart two, we see the return loss and the 153 megahertz changes. Now let's check the third model. The third model is of 50 G, 15 G hertz stop frequency with the other sampling settings untouched. So it has the same profile as the reference model, but with less bandwidth. The last channel model is with the sampling step of 60. 2.5 megahertz, it is apparent that the under sample channel as parameters deviates match from the reference model in chart 1, 2, and 3, especially in the polar plot of insertion loss in chart 3, it looks funky. This is because the electrical length of the backplane is large, so the delay is also large. In the complex plane, the phase change in the polar plot is in proportion to the time delay. Constantly, the polar plot of large delay channel should rotate very rapidly. And there should be enough sampling points in the polar plot to present the rotating smoothly. However, the larger frequency step, the less the sampling points in the S parameters and then the more phase information is missing to maintain the smoothness in the polar plot. Now, I'd like to summarize the results in the next slide. In this example, I have presented you the impact of start frequency, stop frequency, and the frequency step. The analysis is using the interpolation mode. Here comes the summary in the first table as discussed we found causality issues in time domain when using the latter three channel models. The second model, the second table is the summary of the simulations with SMP model interpolation mode of constant extrapolation. Due to the limited presentation time, I don't list the simulation results in the slides. But in brief, we see the similar issues in the three problematic channel models in the two interpolation modes. Now we can draw the conclusion as below. First, the stop frequency should be as close to DC as possible to minimize error between the start frequency and the extrapolated frequency to DC. Second, the stop frequency should be large enough to avoid the Gibbs phenomenon. The last one is that the frequency step should be small enough to avoid the time aliasing to happen. In other words, good S parameters should be of low enough start frequency, high enough stop frequency, fine enough frequency step. Now let's get back to the topic about the ISI simulation flow. If the channel models pass the sanity check, then it is good to run the IBIS MI simulation. But sometimes, the customers also want to check whether their channels meet the standard requirements, such as 803.bj, KR4, or CR4. So we provide the standard check template in the design kit. Here is another example of what our customer can check in the design kit. Due to the limited presentation time, we, don't, we won't go through them in details, but I'm going to show an example of CR4 channel compliance check results in the next slide. The first four plots here are the insertion loss and the return loss mask check. 
Then are the seated insertion loss and ILD mask check. Finally, it is the power sum crosstalk, ICR and ICN calculations. Now our customers can have a comprehensive profile of their channels. Finally, after all the previous work, it is good for the customer to check the channel margin in the IBZMI simulation. In the IBZMI simulation benches, we can check the design performance with and without crosstalk. Generally, the customer can first run the simulation without crosstalk so as to find the optimized victim TX settings. Then they could use the optimized victim settings in the crosstalk simulation. This simulation flow can help the customer to classify the contributions of all the impairments and the transceiver equalization capabilities. As presented in the past slides, Xilinx transceivers have full adaptive RX equalization. It is also correctly modeled in our IPSMI. In the simulation with the crosstalk, the user needs to combine all the next and effects channel models with the victims. As we know, the crosstalk aggressors are also classified into synchronous and asynchronous. The asynchronous crosstalk works as random noise source, but it has bounded distribution. And it is the source of bounded and correlated jitter, or BOJ. The synchronous crosstalk applies more deterministic jitter on the victim. So the different phase relationship between the synchronous aggressors and the victim can cause a various simulation results. In the design kit, the user can also tune the synchronous aggressor's phase against the victim in batch mode, so as to evaluate the impact of the synchronous crosstalk phase relationship. Now I'd like to show you the simulation results. In this graph, I put the simulated I diagram in chart 1, the BR contours extrapolated by ADS in chart 2, and the channel impulse response in chart 3. The chart 4 through chart 6 are the time bus tab, voltage bus tab, I width, and I height measured at BR levels. The results of various TX precursor and postcursor settings are shown like this. Now, let's check the simulation result with crosstalk. In this simulation, we can check the impact of synchronous crosstalk phase relationship to, uh, to the victim. It should be noted there are also other asynchronous aggressors applied in the simulation. Here are the phase sweep results. And you can see the aggressor phase impact on the BR contour shapes. So far, I have presented you some of our work on the signal integrity analysis for 100G designing. We also have done plenty of work to, cor to correlate our IPCI models to the silicon. We have developed a new methodology to do the hardware correlation for the IPCI model. Later, I will give you a brief introduction on it. Next, I'm hoping to show you some model-to-lab comparison we have done over a customer backplane. Here is the victim channel FCMI simulation BR contour. In the simulation, we use the same TX settings as the silicon configuration in the lab measurement. And the RF equalization is in adaptation. The BR contours are extrapolated from 1E-5 to 1E-20 by ADS. The plot below is the eye scan result from Xilinx iBird. The eye scan was done at 1E-9 BR level. Then we do the contour height and the contour width measurement at 1E-8 for both ADS and IBERT BR contours. Besides, the four corners of both the contours at 1E-8 are marked. Now I'm going to compare them by overlap them.
as shown here, we are satisfied with this comparison result. Now, we do the same comparison on the crosstalk result. Again, here is the IBIS MI simulation BR contours with fast and next aggressors, among which there are asynchronous and asynchronous aggressors. The plot below is the eye scan result from iBERT. The eye scan was done at 1U-9 BR level. Again, we measure them and mark the corners. Now we compare them. Again, we have good comparison result. So far, I have introduced a Linux work for 100 GE design. As we know, with the demand of the bandwidth growing, the single lane data rate keeps going up. We have also been ready for the requirement beyond 100 G. And it is a 400 G defined by IEEE 802.3BS. The 400 G adopts the PAM4 and the same fax scheme as the 100 G KP4. Then it is 8 by 53 point one twenty five GBPS for the four hundred G bandwidth. Xilinx has successfully developed the fifty six G PAM4 technology and we released the demo video earlier this year. Here I take a screen capture of the video to show the excellent linearity of the TX output PAM4I. At the same time, the IBIS AMI simulated the TX output pen for i is shown beside it. Then let's compare them. Again, we obtain good correlation between the IBIS AMI simulation in channel seam and the lab silicon measurement at 56 GBPS. Next, I'm hoping to share with you some useful Linux resources to help our customers to make successful designs. The first is the Linux IBIS AMI models. Our customers can visit Linux web to apply for the access to the IBIS AMI model launcher. We have developed more than five generations of the IBIS AMI models since 65 nanometer vertex 5 family. Then I'd like to give a brief overview of Xilinx IBIS AMI modeling work. The first is the work we present in DesignCon last year on the observations of the IBIS AMI simulation over the 60 day tours. We made the extensive comparison and discussions in this tutorial. The second is the work that Xilinx co-presented with Cisco about the novel methodology of IBIS AMI hardware correlation. In this paper, the concept of the trend and distribution analysis is presented. This novel approach can provide much more comprehensive and accurate correlation information than the traditional model-to-lab correlation method. And we have applied this correlation approach in all our ultra-scale and ultra-scale plus FPGA transceiver IBS AMI model correlation work there. On the 56G PAM4 topic, we have several design count papers from last year. The paper IBS AMI modeling for 56 PAM4 introduced the work based on the ADS channel sim simulations. This year, we present the Xilinx 56 PAM4 technology in a tutorial in the DesignCon. And we will continue to present the new progress of the 56 PAM4 technology in the coming DesignCon 2017. Finally, all customers can get the ADS workspace presented in this webinar by contacting the Xilinx IO specialist covering their company accounts. Now, I'd like to give the presentation back to Stephen. Thank you very much, Brandon. So uh, the webcast recording is going to be placed um, on this, uh, this link here. You're also going to be receiving an email with it. Um, also, we have uh, from Keysight Signal Integrity and Power Integrity Resources, which is uh, a list of um, white papers and application notes 
and also um, uh, design con proceedings. So if you click through to that link, the ESOF-SIPI-Resources, um, you'll have a, a web form there where you can specify which of the materials you'd like to download. And also, if at any time you'd like to get a free trial of ADS, then you know, please, uh, please contact us there. Just recently, we've added seven new SIPI tutorial videos on YouTube. Um, these are more uh, self-guided tutorials um, showing you how to use IBIS AMI simulation within ADS, and that is where I'd, um, I'd guide you to for a first look at, um, at, at how to simulate with ADS. Okay, so thank you very much, and now I pass back to, to Chris, the moderator. Thank you. Now on to a question and answer session. Here's our first question. What is the typical amount of loss we see at the Nyquist frequency, and how long is it? Uh, generally, for backplane application, uh, the insertion loss we have seen at the Nyquist frequency is around from uh, 25 dB to 30 dB. Some special cases, it could be even over 30 dB. And the backplane, uh, total backplane system, the uh, trace length is good up to uh, 40 inches. Generally, it's uh, around uh, uh, 35 to 40 inches uh, compared to it's almost around one meter. Thank you. Now, next question. Which Xilinx FPGA is appropriate for 100G? Uh, actually, um, our customers can uh, go to our web. Um, there are the uh, product selection um, guide there. Uh, I can give a brief introduction of that. So for our product, the 20 nanometer node is uh, ultra scale, and the 60 nanometer is ultra scale plus. All our FPGA's uh, vertex uh, family equip the uh, GTY transceiver. Uh, at 20 nanometer, the GTY transceiver is going up to a 30.5 GBPS. In the, uh, at the 60 nanometer, is 25 uh, 75 GBPS. So all the GTY support the uh, 100 G applications. And for example, um, in the vertex ultra scale FPGA's. We have XC, uh, XCVU 065, 80, 95, uh, 160, and uh, 190. And the highest, the highest bandwidth, or the most bandwidth we can achieve is uh, with 60 GTYs. That means uh, uh, 15 quads of GTYs. And uh, for uh, one quad, you can support uh, one uh, 100 GE uh, link there. Also, uh, Xilinx have the uh, integrated the 100 G Ethernet uh, uh, Mac IP there. We offer integrated the 100 G uh, Mac and the physical coding sublayer for high performance applications. And if uh, audience and our customers are interested in this. Please contact our FAE or sales, and go to search our web webcast for more information. Thanks. Thank you. And here's our next question. You spoke about ILD and FEXT, NEXT, but is ICR, insertion loss to crosstalk ratio, important for 100 gigabit Ethernet? Yes. Uh, so the question is whether the ICR is important for 100 Ethernet? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, it's important. Actually, uh, we see crosstalk is a very important uh, item when doing the whole system. ICR is to evaluate, actually, uh, besides the insertion loss, how, mu how much crosstalk you will have there. So you will get the, uh, actually the, the ratio there. Uh, generally, without cross out, a transceiver can support the insertion loss uh, to a very high value. But with cross sock, the aggressors will take the margin, and you will see with uh, with some cross sock, the insertion loss, uh, uh, the ISI uh, equalization capability gets uh, dropped a little bit because the margin is taken by the cross sock. So ICR is also a very important uh, item to check. But per the spec, uh, generally, we also check the COM, the channel operating margin, uh, to evaluate the cross -off. Thanks.
Okay, here's our next question. Has Xilinx used X parameters to model high-speed links, and any thoughts on its future potential? Uh, X parameters. Uh, perhaps that's one that I can field. Um, so X parameters uh, is um, uh, very important in, in RF applications where we can capture the, the nonlinear behavior of, of an, an active device, for instance. Um, so depending on the, the input power to it or depending on temperature, you'd have the ability to, to capture its response uh, you know, uh, correctly in a, in a, uh, a confined model. Um, uh, in signal integrity, we, we, we haven't seen um, the, the application for, for X parameters yet. And mostly it's because of the reason that um, uh, X parameters uh, are, say, are very good at um, capturing the specific frequency information, but most of what we use in signal integrity is very, very wide bandwidth. Um, so it's just a, it's, a, it's a different application space. Okay, here's our next question. Does your IBIS AMI model of the transceiver auto-adapt like the real receiver would? Uh, yes. Uh, we have verified our adaptation code and the, uh, and the silicon performance. We actually uh, also customer, our customer can also check the results. Uh, we, we plot all the adaptation results of CTLE, AGC, DFE, uh, and the CDR, uh, CDR clock ticks in the uh, CSV file, and the uh, customer also can read out the adaptation codes uh, from Ibert, uh or actually uh, from uh, from our uh, Vivado uh, transceiver wizard. Uh, also can check the real silicon adaptation code and to do the comparison. Uh, one thing to uh, to be noted is we don't expect 100% same because. We know, um, including including all the channels, models, and uh, the 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 simplified model uh, architecture there, it won't reflect 100% performance of the real silicon in all cases. We uh, so that's why uh, we put forward the trend and the, and the uh, the distribution methodology to describe this. Actually, the correlation should be based on the static static statistic uh, uh, process, but not just a point-to-point uh, -point comparison. Point-to-point -point comparison sometimes will give you very good uh, encouraging results, but it won't reflect all the cases there. So in brief, we have correlated the uh, adaptive code uh, against the silicon in, in our, our PVT verification test. Thanks. OK, next question. How is COM included in, in the analysis, and how will this COM predict the IBIS, AMI, and lab correlation? Uh, pardon me? How is, can you repeat the question? COM, how is COM included in the analysis, and how well does it predict the IBIS, AMI, and lab cor correlation? Oh, sure, thanks. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have the COM uh, integrated in the ADS workspace because uh, there is already um, in the uh, shared sources from IEEE work group uh, the uh, MATLAB-based uh, project. So uh, customers and also uh, we also use the, uh, that uh, project to do the COM evaluation. So we don't have the COM evaluation inside the ADS. Uh, uh, but we have the, compared the COM uh, analysis result against the IDSMI simulation. We think it's still necessary to do time domain simulation uh, with IDSMI model. COM can predict something, but sometimes COM could be pessimistic and uh, won't give you a uh, straightforward estimation of the performance. So PVT corner simulation in time domain and uh, correlated to the hardware is necessary to correctly understand the silicon performance. Thanks. Okay, well, that concludes today's presentation. On behalf of Electronic Design, I'd like to thank Keysight Technologies and Xilinx for sponsoring today, today's event, and of course, all of you for joining. Have a great day.